Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Markoff, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Sure. Um, let's see. I'm a, a more or less retired uh, technology and science writer, journalist. Um, I, uh, I I grew up in, in what became Silicon Valley. I, I, I was born in Palo Alto, grew up in Palo Alto, California. Um, and beginning in 1981, I, I began writing for uh, technology and hobbyist publications, writing about stuff that was going on in Silicon Valley related to the personal computer industry. Um, 1985, I took a job as a technology uh, journalist at the San Francisco Examiner. And then in 1988, I was hired by the New York Times as their national computer writer. And four years later, I came back to Silicon Valley. I went to New York for four years. And then from 1992 to when I retired from the Times in 2017, I I, I wrote about uh, technologies and for a while spent time in the science section in, in the New York Times as well. But I followed stuff that was coming out of Silicon Valley, and and uh, uh, I am I am still interested, still writing a little bit. Um, I'm still around the Valley. Uh, I live uh, adjacent to Stanford University at the moment. And uh, it's an interesting time to be in Silicon Valley again. Things are all spun up. Do you um do you feel like you write about Silicon Valley because you're just tied to it because you live in it, and also you kind of were, I wouldn't say raised, but you started there. Yeah, you know, I I was uh, I I was uh, an activist uh, when I was in college and afterwards uh, an anti-war activist. And when I first began to work as a journalist, I worked as a freelancer before. 1981 for five or six years, I was very interested in um, the U.S. military and the development of military technologies. Uh, and you know, they were uh, there was a an aerospace industry in what would become Silicon Valley. There were companies like Lockheed, and there was an electronic warfare industry. And I actually began writing about that, but out of my my interest in uh, the military industrial complex, it was what it was called at the time. And um, then Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, and it, there, there was at that point the microprocessor had come along, the personal computer had come along, and there was what I saw as the dark side of the forest because there was a real military buildup uh, going on under the Reagan administration, and then the light side of the forest were these personal computer hobbyists, and it was just more fun to write about the hobbyists than it was to write about the, the war machine. So I, I, I wrote more and more about the emerging PC industry, and I kind of grew up with it. Um, people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were were coming out of a hobbyist industry and becoming a very, you know, large, uh, uh, large and successful uh, industry that was impacting all of American society. Did you ever like see that predict that happening? I wouldn't. I think if they would have known the internet would have got so big, they probably would have charged people for it, not had it been free but it became this massive thing i mean it's in every single one of our lives we're using it right now to communicate but I, i'm pretty sure every single person can't go maybe an hour without looking up something on their phone or something i mean it's so easy it's ease of access it's right in your pocket i mean even if i go to, i try and make it a deal when i go to the grocery store just leave it in the car you don't need it for that 20 minutes you're in there well, I won't say anything about predicting it, but I will tell you um, why I went in this direction. I stumbled across a book in, I think it was probably 1980, called The Micro Millennium, written by a man by the name of Christopher Evans, who was very interested in describing the impact. He was a British journalist who was describing the impact of the microprocessor on society. And uh, I looked at that book and I thought, you know, he's probably right. Um, it is going to have this massive impact, which you're describing. And uh, why don't I make that my beat? And I did. And it kind of worked out. I, I've written about little else besides the impact of, of, of these technologies based on, on the technologies emerged from Silicon Valley during that decade. Uh, now, how did I, Silicon Valley get its start? Was that because of the there was a like chemical stuff, right? There were industry. It was a big industry area, if I'm not mistaken. Well, there was an aerospace industry. Um, that's a really good question. Um, why did Silicon Valley happen here and not around Boston or in the Hudson Valley or something like that? Um, there, there are a variety of explanations and and um, a bunch of things came together and including uh, the, the political and the, the counterculture that you're interested in were all alive on the mid peninsula during the 1960s. But there were a set of things that happened. For example, um, William Shockley, who was one of the co-inventors of the transistor, 
um, decided to move to Palo Alto to set up a company because his aging mother was in Palo Alto and he wanted to be closer to his mother. And I often think about how things would have been different if Shockley's mother was in Kansas instead of in Palo Alto. But Stanford was here. And Frederick Terman was a, a far-sighted administrator at Stanford and Dean of Engineering. And he really wanted to build um, an industrial base next to the campus so his students wouldn't have to move east. That was going on uh, as, I mean, that, that led to uh, companies like Varian and Hewlett Packard, which were pre-Silicon Valley companies before the semiconductor industry. Um, but um, Shockley came here and he, uh, he began a transistor company and then he was a terrible manager and people disliked him. And so a group called the Traitorous Eight uh, left and they went to, to work at, at Fairchild uh, do, building this, this, these new integrated circuits te technology that was just emerging and and then that blossomed into dozens and then hundreds of chip companies. Uh, this was before personal computing. So they were being used in, I mean, the reason you wanted to build integrated circuits initially was you wanted um, you wanted more computing power in the, the noses of missiles and in, in, in the space shuttle. Um, they needed more computing and, and this was a way to do it. And, and then um, a consumer industry emerged, you, you know, um, microprocessors, uh, went, well, they were microcontrollers, they weren't full on microprocessors, they went into watches, they were digital watches very early on. And then the then video games, um, there was a, a video game industry emerged, and that drove a consumer business. And then in 1975, personal computers really caused it to take off and became a, a you know, became a business product. That's interesting. I, I have to ask about the counterculture that was going on. You, you said you were an activist. I mean, was, so there was a large amount of counterculture that was going out there. I've learned more about the stuff that happens on the East Coast because that's where I'm at and that's where I'm located. It's just kind of stuff that comes up around here. But I know they were out there in the West Coast, but I've only learned maybe briefly about some weather underground stuff. But I don't I mean, I would think that if you're selling making chips for the military industry and making it for personal use as well, too. I don't know. I just see complications if you're like a lot of if there's counterculture activists back then. I mean, were there any activists that were exploring that route? Yeah. So the, let's let me unpack your question, because when you talk about the counterculture, you can actually mean many different things. Um, th there were many threads of of what you describe as the counterculture happening all, all over the United States, but pretty, pretty intensively on the West Coast and very intensively on the peninsula. Um, but some of it was very political, and some of it was was either apolitical or or anarchistic, not not uh, you know co not conventionally political. Um, and the groups interacted with each other, but they are, often were not the same. I mean, the Weather Underground um, was a group that grew out of the Students for Democratic Society, and the Students for Democratic Society emerged in the in the mid Midwest largely in opposition to. Uh, the war in Vietnam in in the in the early 1960s, but at the same time there was a cultural movement, um, largely. Uh, well, there was one. There was stuff happening in New York, but there was it was centered in San Francisco in the in the early. Well, there was a Bohemian movement in San Francisco in the 50s in North Beach, um, the Beatniks, and they were largely supplanted. A, mer a music scene emerged in San Francisco circa 64, 65, 66. There was something called the Trips Festival that happened in 1966 in San Francisco, which was organized by Stuart Brand and um, Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters, who had obviously been very affected by LSD. Um, but, it, it, you know, it was that Trips Festival that, that you know, 10,000 people showed up over a long weekend to to. Uh, go to what was uh, you know, later became sort of a, a standard kind of rock concert music in uh, San Francisco music in in the city. It led directly to the creation of the Fillmore Auditorium, run by Bill Graham and the San Francisco music scene. But it also led to the creation of this community called Haight Ashbury, which really was sort of imprinted on the uh, on the national consciousness. But I would put the Weather Underground and the hippie community in the hate in very different baskets. I mean, there were some overlap, but, and, you know, from a distance, it all looks like the same thing. But when you were in the middle of it, um, the people who were highly political, political 
activists um, were very different than the hippies who were into peace, love, macrame, macrame and, and uh, some marijuana and LSD. Um, although, you know, there were people who sort of crossed over. Abby Hoffman was uh, a part of what was called a new left that was very cultural left. Um, and he was he was probably more of an anarchist than the Weather Underground, who were really sort of taking their marching orders from Mao and Maoist experience and, and the Cuban Revolution. Um, and uh, all of this was going on. There was a, a, a very powerful national draft resistance movement, which I think you would call countercultural. People were saying refusing to to be drafted and were going to prison. I don't blame um, them. I don't blame them. Yeah, that was that was that was um, a, a very divisive uh, period in the country. Um, you know, there there was uh, there was a, um, a, a, a a so called silent majority that supported Richard Nixon and elected Richard Nixon. Um, um, McGovern um, did not get very big part of the um, the electoral vote in that 1972 election, but um, the. You know the country was changing dramatically, and the counterculture had a big impact. and And Stuart Brand's um, uh, Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog, which emerged first in '68, um, was really um, uh, sort of the bible of the counterculture you're describing. Um, and it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that I came away understanding from the the research I did um, for his biography was that. Uh, Brand's um, whole earth catalog was really much closely, more closely related to the emergence of Silicon Valley than people generally understood. And if you if you remember the catalog on the cover, it said whole earth catalog, but right underneath it, it said access to tools. And um, that he got in part from Buckminster Fuller, who was this sort of you know important figure in the counterculture movement, the guy who who uh, designed these geodesic domes and. And Fuller basically argued that if you wanted to change society, the right way to do it was to give a person a tool and teach them how to use it. And Brand really bought into that. But there was another person who influenced him equally on that access to tools. And that was a man by the name of Douglas Engelbart. Engelbart had a laboratory um, on the peninsula just off campus at an organization that was then called Stanford Research Institute during the 1960s. And he set out to use computers to do what he called augment human intelligence. And so in 1962, he created this laboratory. And on the other side of campus, this is Stanford campus, the same year, there was another man, John McCarthy, who set up another laboratory called the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And he was trying to design machines that replaced humans. So on one side of campus, you had AI, artificial intelligence, and on the other side of the campus, you had intelligence augmentation, IA. And this was this dichotomy and a paradox that would come to define this tension in the computing industry to this day. We're still struggling with whether you design people into the system or you design people out of the system. But Engelbart, um, Engelbart had this notion that the computer would become the universal tool, which is he was right. And he designed all of the you know, if you want to trace the the tools that we use now, your personal computers, your phones, the the web, all of that came out of Engelbart's lab initially. And Brand became very close to Engelbart in 1967 and was very influenced by Engelbart's view. So that tool centric view um, influenced a big part of the counterculture, which is not something that's generally understood. Unless, of course, I don't know if you. Did you ever see Steve Jobs' 2005 Stanford commencement address? I've never saw the 2005 one, but I've seen speeches of him. Yeah, you should take a – it's really a fun uh, – he he gave – it's probably the most commencement address – I mean, the, the most watched commencement address in history. I think 50 million people have seen it or something like that. But in the end, he, uh, he leaves people with a, a quote from Stuart Brand, um, stay hungry, stay foolish – um, was his so invocation to the Stanford graduate students. But it, he talked about how influential the catalog was on him, which I think was generally true. That It wasn't just the people who were going back to the land. It wasn't just the hippies. It wasn't just the people who were living communes. It was people like myself who were, um, who were not going back to the land, but were sort of wandering around the edges and looking for interesting stuff. The catalog was this very important. Jobs called it Google before Google. Um, information was hard to find in the 1960s. 
um, you had to go to a bookstore or a library. And what Brand did is he curated uh, hundreds, thousands of interesting things. And it was in everybody's it was in everybody's house. Um, there were a lot of people who did want to go back to the land, and it it sort of provided a, a catalog of, of technologies that you would need, the things you would need if you were going to live off the land, and um, and really shaped the perception of a big part of that um, community that you think of as the counterculture. That's interesting. I mean, he probably didn't even know what he was doing at the time when he did, and how much impact it was going to have. I think you mean brand. Yeah, I think yeah. I I think so. Well, it was a pivot. It was, you know, they talk about pivots in Silicon Valley. When you have a startup, you go in one direction, it doesn't work. And then you pivot and go in another direction. And so brand came up with the idea, not of a catalog, but of something he called the whole earth truck store. He was flying back from his father's funeral in 1967, trying to figure out what he was going to do with the rest of his life. And he realized that a lot of his friends were going to, back to the communes. And so he decided to create what he called the truck store. He would fill up a truck with interesting books and tools and drive around to the communes and try to sell them stuff. Oh, man. He did that. Uh, it took a couple of trips during the summer of 67, and he realized his friends didn't have any money. And so that wasn't going to work. <laughs> and so it sort of devolved into a catalog, and the catalog struck a chord. And so the first, uh, he published 20,000 copies initially in the fall of 68, but by and, and it, it, it took off like a rocket ship. By uh, 1972, they sold three million copies. It became the book of the year in 19. It was it won the National Book Award in 19 in 1972, and it just um, it hammered Stewart. It was just too much responsibility. It was too much of a project, and so he actually shut it down very quickly. It came out twice a year for three years, and then they were it was published episodically after that. But the real uh, sort of period was just a three year period, but it had a huge impact on on my generation during that period. When it comes to brand, I mean, I know he kind of with the whole Silicon Valley thing and your interest for him, but I mean, with his impact on everything Silicon Valley and relating even to the counterculture, I mean, why doesn't it really get mentioned? Why is it just always the stereotypical, like, you know, you see the hippies or you see something like that? You don't really hear about this. Well, there are different perspectives. Actually, there, there, there is, I mean, the fact that two people are creating IA and then AI on like the same campus, I just want to be in that like area, just that general facility. It was a great, great time. Um, I was a college student in 1971, and I uh, came back to Stanford. I'd grown up around Stanford, but I walked into this, the Tressler Coffee House, and there was this strangest thing I'd ever seen. It was uh, I'd never seen interactive television. It was a game, a video game. It was the first video game called Space War. Um, they called it a galaxy game on campus because you couldn't use the word space war. But space war had been developed by hackers at MIT, and it came out when McCarthy went from MIT to Stanford. And um, it was very simple. It preceded Pong, which became Nolan Bushnell's very successful video game. Um, but it involved um, some joysticks uh, on a console and a, a round screen and some spaceships that sort of floated around and shot at each other. And that kind of blew my mind because I didn't know that television was interactive. I, this was you know, two-way television, and, and it had that kind of impact on, on, on a lot of people. But um, uh, so that, that the, the, the broader issue that you're asking about and the, the, the relationship between the counterculture and Silicon Valley is, is very complex and it's hotly debated. Uh, my book uh, came out in 2005, What the Dormouse Said, uh, and then three years later, a Stanford communications professor, Fred Turner, wrote a book called um, From um, Counterculture to Cyberculture. And we have different perspective um, about brand. I, I saw brand as, as the messenger, um, sort of, he didn't create Silicon Valley. He didn't create the values of Silicon Valley, but he basically brought that out to a broader part of the population. Um, Turner has a different view, and his argument is that this idea of di digital libertarianism became to define parts of Silicon Valley in the 1990s around the dot-com issue, uh, a dot-com era emerged from uh, Brands World, which, which is not something that I agree with. Um, and it's complicated and inside baseball. But, but um, I think that Brand was really, the whole earth catalog was an expression of things that were happening on the peninsula about technology and 
um, uh, the sort of the democratization of technology that was really transformative. And it, it was the first sort of word that that was going on for the broader society. Um, and uh, and it, of course, did have that impact on, on, on the culture. I don't think he created that. Um, you know, there's, it took me a while to figure out what the relationship, you know, you asked about um, taking LSD and being more creative. I, I never believed that 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 you can't take a pill and become creative. I, I think that the evidence there's there are there are a lot there are a number of people in Silicon Valley who believe that um, that you know microdosing is a fad among the engineering community in Silicon Valley at this point. But I don't think there's really firm evidence that you get creativity from a pill. I have a different sociological idea that that came from reading um, the work of people around something called the Santa Fe Institute, um, a physics a research institute in New, in New Mexico. And there's some social science scientists there who argued that um, creativity happens at the edge of chaos. And if you think and think about that in a sociological sense, if you think about what was going on in the peninsula during that period, 65 to 75, um, around Stanford, Palo Alto, Menlo Park, uh, Mountain View, um, there were these three laboratories. Um, there was McCarthy's laboratory that I mentioned to you, Engelbart's laboratory, and then in 1970, Xerox set up a laboratory called the Palo Alto Research Center. And all of the stuff that we basically use for modern computing, um, personal computing um, and uh, computer networks, the web, that was pioneered there. Um, and all around, while they were doing that research, it was just chaotic. Um, there was there was a, 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 an intense uh, po um, political anti-war movement. There was a civil rights movement. There was a counterculture um, in the in the kind of um, sense of, of the hippies and stuff. And all of that was was surrounding those laboratories. And I think that that's the, the edge of chaos that that those scientists were describing. And that that kind of environment leads to creativity. Do you think that there were? I mean, if if we agree with that, do you think that that would be like looking for like a way out or something to be better? I mean, it literally pushed in a whole bunch of things to where everyone started having this focus and interest in the technology, which helped Silicon Valley. And my, it seems like it helped Silicon Valley grow a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I mean, the valley grew um, because there were applications for these integrated circuit devices that became consumer markets. And, um, you know, it started with the watch, the video game industry, the personal computer industry, um, uh, and then mobile uh, technologies. Each of those markets uh, reached a larger portion of the world. They were just, um, as John Doerr, who's um, a well-known Silicon Valley um, uh, venture capitalist, said um, it was the largest legal accumulation of wealth in history. So the valley grew based on the markets. Um, the the creativity and the innovation that came out of the valley, um, that's a that's a harder thing to pin down. Why why here? Why not Los Angeles, for example? Why not why not Boston? Um, why would these technologies emerge here first? It's a it's a difficult question to add, to answer definitively. Do you think that the mindset of those guys back then when they were working in the individual labs compared to the mindset of what, where or just where the technology has gone today do you think that they were predicting or would even think that it would go this way and want it to go this way i feel like today tech is in large hands of like major corporations now yeah yeah that's that's an, inter an interesting question um i think there were some people at the very beginning uh who realized that uh it was going to transform society i mean engelbart was have you ever heard of the term Moore's law? Um, so Gordon Moore was one of the co-founders of Intel, and in 1965 he realized that computing power was increasing exponentially, that uh, the the density of of semiconductors was doubling on a two year rate, and uh, what happened as a result of that is every two years, uh, you know, computers got not only more powerful and faster, they got cheaper not in a linear fashion, but in an increasing fashion. So they got cheaper, faster, and they got power more powerful, faster. And um, Engelbart was actually the one who was the first one to foresee, uh, he was one of the first people to foresee Moore's, Moore's Law, what would become called Moore's Law. And 
he realized there would be enough computing power around in society to do these kinds of things, that computers would become cheap enough that they would be everywhere. And that that was that was a big deal to to understand to understand that and have some sense of that and that that drove these 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 people. Um, for example, Bill Gates, who was who was not in the Silicon Valley, but he was very affected by Silicon Valley. Um, Bill Gates early on realized that they you could put a computer with the falling prices of based on microprocessors, you could, could put a computer on every desktop. That was a big deal back then. It seems completely obvious now, but back then then. Um, computers were largely behind um, glass in large corporate settings, and you couldn't get access to them. So it was a huge transformation. Jobs understand, understood that too. I mean, the, the interesting thing about um, Apple and the, the kind of model that it provided for Silicon Valley is the two co-founders had sort of different values. Um, Wozniak didn't want to start a company. Wozniak just wanted to design a computer so he could show it to his friends at the Homebrew Computer Club. Um, it was the classic open source um, uh, orientation. Jobs, who, who was his friend and and his collaborator, understood there would be a market, and it was those two things uh, in tandem that uh, that created Apple Computer and, all, and all, uh, often drove many of the early companies in the Valley. There were there were people who understood there would be markets, but there were also people who were just fascinated with the technologies. This term. Um, you know, hacker, the term hacker changed its meaning in the 1980s, but originally a hacker was someone who just wanted to explore the technology and push it as an, as an, an end in itself because it was intellectually fascinating. And that hacker community was a big part of what drove Silicon Valley. Like playing video games on a calculator. And then now we have people that are actually trying to get people's personal information and data security and all this other type of stuff. Yeah, and it became, well, uh, you know, it's interesting. It started as hackers, but then uh, nation states realized that there was value in, in this technology and, and it changed into a, a weapon of, of militaries and governments. So it, it's, it's vastly different than what it was in the 1970s and the 1980s. Do you think that it, there's just too much when it comes to technology out there, that that's, we've gone in this kind of opposite direction that maybe it was in the beginning. Like I know we're still pushing forward and we're still making newer things, but I've noticed the adverse reactions between a lot of people now, either with, with, if it's social media or if it's just technology in general, there's a disdain against at least my generation a little bit younger now I'm starting to see. And I see my grandparents learning more than I ever possibly could on Facebook, Instagram, and all these other apps, which is just a complete turn of events. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't see, I mean, are people going to walk away from the technology? I mean, that's sort of what you're posing, the question you're posing. And I generationally, I mean, I, there was a piece in the New York Times recently about a generation who've gone black, back to flip phones. Um, yeah. I, I don't see, I, I don't see an organized resistance to people walking away from this technology. I, I worry more about the opposite, that the, that the technology becomes so tightly wound up a, around us that it's a little bit like Star Trek. You know, remember the Borg? Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. Um, I worry more about that. Uh, I, and I, I, you know, it's possible that people could decide they want a less technological existence, but everything seems to suggest that at every turn, technology becomes woven more into the human experience um, from microelectronics to now biotechnologies. From like an ethical, I mean, every I aspect ask, of life. I would ask you from your personal perspective, but also maybe ask you if you're looking at it from like an ethical lens as well too i mean don't you think that stuff's a little bit dangerous when we start talking like i've talked to futurists and i've talked to like the transhumanists who want to you know merge with machine and all this type of stuff in the beginning it was interesting and it was fun to have the conversation about but then once i start t learning a little bit more about it and talking with more people on it i realize how serious they are and how deep they want to go into either cloning or cryogenics or whatever it is and i'm like hey i don't think we have the technology to be like you shouldn't be signing up for that yet until we know that the technology is right but I, I said i'm more of a luddite when it comes to a lot of this stuff so i'm not their biggest fan but i mean putting a chip in your head like elon musk wanted to do at one point and i get it was an idea and tossing it out there but i'm Build like does yeah yeah no musk's is about interface and i let's go back to my notion of the borg i mean i think apple just introduced these glasses uh that are going to sit on your head i think that at a minimum um it's important that you be able to take the glasses off um the notion of, of a brain computer interface that is not removable to me is a potentially very frightening thing 
for that Borg kind of uh, science fiction notion of you lose you lose the boundary between what is the human and what is the machine. Um, and 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 whatever you have, it might be a very powerful thing, but it wouldn't be human. So if we want to hold on to our humanity, um, I think we have to, there are some design choices that people will make. And um, you can design people into that future in, in a human way, or you can design it for machines. Now, I, I worry, I mean, the ethical worries I have are around um, the way decisions are made. Um, Terry Winograd was a, a, a pioneer in artificial intelligence and very thoughtful person. He was one of the people who, in, as early as the 1980s, actually walked away from the AI side of the coin and went over to the IA side of the coin. He began working on technologies that would augment the human experience rather than replace it. We were talking about the ethical question you're raising, and his response to me was, well, maybe it's not possible in a capitalist society. Um, because the the you know the the values are about profitability, uh, and the the shareholders are the ones who make the ultimate decisions in the capitalist system. I was I was asking him, let's let's talk about the the example of uh, how you might use this technology in a call center, because call centers are really one of the places the economy has grown dramatically since the um, end of the Second World War. Uh, people who answer questions over the telephone, give tech support, sell things. All those jobs are now at risk because of um, generative AI and the ability of these chatbots to, to uh, converse in uh, really compelling ways. Um, so as a designer, do you design this technology to, uh, to uh, basically make a super smart call center operator, or do you, do you just get rid of the operator because that's an extra cost? And that's that's an economic decision that's going to be made um, as these technologies, uh, you know, become more commonplace and in, in, enter the workplace. Do you want to hear the response I got from a transhumanist when I asked that question? Sure. <laughs> they said sure. that, well, you're programmed to think that you actually need to work. Imagine if you didn't have to go to work. And I was like, yeah, but people like to work. And like, you know, you only think you have to like to work. And I'm like, damn, you might have a really good argument there because I don't know. But that is, I mean, it's a big fear and it's. What's it's technology for me? It's just like I don't. Do you think people will ever reject where it goes? I know a lot of people that don't like it being attached to their body or something like that. They think that's a little bit step too far. But there's also people that just want the next thing. I mean, we see it with the people that wait three days for an iPhone at a store when it's about to be released. So for me, it's like trying to find what that boundary would be. And I would only see a split between people again, like a different divide, much like I was divided between political parties. There's a divide between people when it comes to people with tech and people that don't want to do the whole full tech advancement. But then eventually, doesn't everything evolve to only needing the tech? Like, yeah, okay, you don't have to have this chip, but then eventually like what, four years from now, it's a requirement. Like it kind of starts getting into that area. Yeah, we're in an interesting juncture right now. I was, I think, almost everybody, even the most sophisticated technologists in Silicon Valley, have been surprised by the large language models and um, the rapid rate at which they've been adopted um, globally um, is is really uh, uh, dramatic. Uh, so I was in, I was in New Zealand on the North Island in in uh, February. And I was driving around near a resort lake and I turned on rock radio and I was listening to these two disc jockeys and they were cracking jokes about chatbots. Um, I've never seen a technology disseminate um, as rapidly as generative AI has. And um, I have no idea where it's going. And I don't believe that anybody who claims to have an idea where it's going knows where it's going. Um, Right now, there's a, a significant problem with this technology that's described as hallucinations. I mean, these machines tend to make things up. They literally make things up. Like the art apps, the ones that you can do like an AI well, art Well, the art app. apps, now that's an interesting question. The art apps, you, it's imagination. So what's making things up? No, I'm talking about the, the chatbots. So if you add, let, let me tell you about my first experience with um, ChatGPT3. Uh, I, I was playing with it last November, and the first thing I did is ask it about myself, and it described John Markoff, a technology reporter in the New York Times, and then it said, who died in 2017? And I said, what? <laughs> what? I, I, there's no John Markoff that died in 2017. 
And I, I argued with it for like two or three weeks. And finally, I convinced it that I was still alive. And it now no longer says that I'm dead. I don't know if a human changed that or if the machine decided I was right. I don't know what happened. But I finally decided that, that what it was saying is that, you know, John Markoff left the New York Times in 2017. And for all practical purposes, he was as good as dead. Um, so, um, but um, there is a poor lawyer in New York who used uh, ChatGPT to file a brief. And uh, the the opposing party discovered that all of the citations uh, in the brief had been made up by by ChatGPT. I mean, it was just that's what they mean by hallucination. They don't know how to solve that problem yet, and I think that that's a that's a gating um, function on the value of that technology. And people who tell you it's going to be easy to solve that problem, uh, I don't. I, I'm not going to believe them until I actually see progress being made. I haven't seen a lot of progress being made yet. On the other hand, one place where I can see it having those those systems having a dramatic impact right now in the real world in Silicon Valley is in the process of programming. It's really changed the way people program. They don't they don't program anymore. They describe the program and ChatGPT writes the code, which it's borrowed because it was it was trained on. The vast resources in 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 systems like GitHub, which is an open source repository of code, so it's changed the nature of that work. Um, there 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 are dozens of examples like that. I mean, the people at Microsoft at Microsoft Research believe that the machines, in some cases, show um, flashes of creativity, uh, and that's remarkable if it's true. Uh, there's a big debate inside the computer science community of whether these things are uh, the the term is stochastic parrot. Um, is it just a statistical machine that's coming up with the next right word in a conversation, or is there something else afoot? Um, what they call emergent properties. And so I've never I've never seen a period like this before. the The art is remarkable. Um, the uh, the music is remarkable. I mean, what if you can get a machine to play infinite Bach? How does that change? You know, how does that change the the world the world of uh, uh, the, uh, the world for musicians? And I don't think we know yet. Um, there are intellectual property issues that haven't been solved because they're trained on human music and and and, and human poetry and human writing. There's a, a AI that created Amy Winehouse's like song, some more songs of hers, like newer songs, and it is damn good it is really really good but i was just like does that not hit intellectual rights or laws or anything like that where i start going and this is just my little like joke but eventually you're signing a paper when they say rights and likeliness they really mean rights and likeliness to you when you're dead they're gonna use you in a movie trust me so it becomes a real thing and i think that's i mean i never expected technology to do that even I tried to create AI music for a while to do an intro for the show because it was like I bet, better than anything I could create. It's just so and it learns so quickly, which is the scary thing where I'm sitting there. It takes me like a month to try and learn an instrument. And this thing just like, boom, no, you don't like that one. Here's another one that you really like. Yeah. But I think that um, the technology is changing still. We haven't seen the end point of this. There are some people who believe these things will be superhuman. I'm I'm still skeptical about that. Superhuman in their intelligence. Do you think they'll have their own consciousness? Do I think that um, the guy from Google said that the thing had consciousness? Yeah, I was like, I yeah, don't know and, about and that. And he got he got fired. <laughs> no. so, uh, I don't see any evidence that we're any. So first of all, we don't understand what consciousness is. So um, you know, if in fact um, these things, are, these neural nets that are at the at the heart of these new systems are akin to our biological neural nets, then I suppose that's true. I don't know that that's actually been proven to be the case yet. So um, I'm going to take a wait and see. And, you know, first, one of the things I learned um, in covering Silicon Valley for, for four decades was that the visionaries are always wrong. I mean, I could reliably bet that some, the technology was going to go in a direction that nobody expected. And so um, I, I do not take for granted the things that people are saying now. We're in we're in what's known as a hype cycle. Remember, it was crypto two years ago. 
now it's now it's AI, and all the crypto experts are now AI experts. So I've seen this uh, I've seen this play before, and uh, it's a good time to be skeptical. Uh, it's it's remarkable, but I think it's it's important to keep our sense of skepticism and and wait and see about how quickly the technology will continue to evolve. Which direction would you like to see it go in? Would you like to see actual robots and things well, that look I like that? I will tell or? you. <laughs> well, you know, there are self-driving cars in San Francisco right now. You can walk down the street and you can see a cruiser or a Waymo without a human in it. And they only run over dogs occasionally and they haven't run over any people yet. I, that sounds scary as hell. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, there's some real problems. Um, they, The people of San Francisco are as a whole not particularly excited about about having these things because they create congestion and uh, it's not clear that we really need them um you know it might be people it might be better for people to walk two or three blocks than to jump in a robot uber um or maybe have an autonomous bus rather than an autonomous car um you, you know there, there are things where where we, you know america is so obsessed with cars uh, cars have defined the form of our cities and you know our society for so many years and it's not clear that that we wouldn't be better with without fewer cars um i have a friend so autonomous vehicles i have a friend who, who says um they won't uh, be truly autonomous, these cars, until you tell them to go to work and they go to the beach instead. <laughs> so, I, uh, I, I mean, that's another concern right there for people is that the auto drive thing. I know people like the auto drive, not having to drive their car and get to do whatever they want. But there's a lot of people out there that feel like that it just they there will never be regular driving again. It's much like workplace um bringing in robots into the workplace to replace jobs. That's everyone's fear is that their job is going to be replaced. So, I mean, with the expansion of tech, when you see it going in a direction, do you think that it's going to be more automation machines and all these types of things? Or do you think it's going to be more about trying to help out humans when it comes to either eye enhancements or things that I would, I would want to fix disabilities if anything, I wouldn't, you know, but I'd also yeah, don't know. Yeah. So I started out as someone who was very worried about um, job displacement. And I, at one point, had a conversation with Danny Kahneman, an economist. And I was, at that point, I had my hair on fire about the impact of robotic automation on manufacturing in China. And he stopped me. He said, you don't get it. Uh, and I was describing this world in which, you know, there would be worker unrest in China. And he said, you know, in China, they'll be lucky if the robots come just in time. And I said, excuse me? And he walked me through the demographic trends in China right now. Um, China has a dramatically rapidly aging population. And so not only do the Chinese not have enough workers to fill their factories, they particularly don't have enough um, uh, aid, they don't have enough elder care um, for the aging population. And so I actually, I changed the question I used. I used to ask people when they thought there would be a real self-driving car. And uh, I realized that wasn't as interesting a question as when will there be a robot that can safely give a shower to an aging human? Harder problem, much harder problem. Um, you know, think about the market for consumer robotics. You know, there, there's one successful product. Um, if you talk about mobile ro uh, robots, you know what it is? It's, just, it's the Roomba. Oh. It's been 24 years since the Roomba was introduced. And wow, I have it's a friend, been 24 years. I have a friend. I have a friend who um, worked in robotics in Google. And I used to tease him because Google was working on home robotics. What's the second product? What What is the next mass product that will have a, a, a mass market that is going to be like a Roomba and do something useful, whether it's going to pick up my socks or it's going to do the dishes? Um, we're no, you know, we have dishwashers. That's a robot, um, but something that's mobile in the home um, that would be very useful is a, a robot that could do elder care. Maybe not a shower, but um, could allow aging humans to stay in place in their home longer and not go to care facilities. Um, that would be a big deal, and I hope that they develop that kind of technology because there are not enough caregivers. 
Um, Are you optimistic and, in that direction? Because I'm very pessimistic. The only 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 technology that's coming is the stuff that the public or massive amount of people are going to want. And I might want the elderly care thing. You might want the elderly care thing. But they're looking at the market aspect of this. And an Amazon Alexa or whatever is a thousand times a better option for them to get their money's worth. Yeah, but you have to remember my generation, which is a market because we have money, is aging. <laughs> and so there's a market. So somebody might actually design that to, to sell the people like us, the old folks. Um, so I'm, I'm not, am I, am I pessimistic? Um, I just don't want to sacrifice the time for something that seems cool when really we could be doing something that's helpful, which is like helping out elderly populations or people that need assistance in their homes rather than trying to worry about the next absolutely. Google binoculars or something like that. Absolutely. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I'm not completely pessimistic because I see things that come out of left field all the time that surprise people. Um, uh, you know, and we really need some surprises uh, in in terms of technology. Uh, for example, workable, economical fusion power would change the world. And it's probably a long shot, um, but it's not. I mean, you know, there are there are at least fifty st startups um, that that are working on um, commercial fusion power now. Um, uh, you, you know, I think it's unlikely that we're going to make it in time but if we do it's it's it would be vital in getting across that chasm um uh, in terms of the problems facing us with respect to climate change do you think that this a lot of this like tech stuff that's going on it's always trending every time i check in twitter it's ai or something like that you mentioned it's kind of like a different trends that hop on something else but do you think that this is something that's going to be maybe the whole tech thing will go down in general and there'll just be a lull like i mean i haven't seen anybody create really anything new but i don't know like you see a boston dynamics robot out of nowhere yeah. well so um anything new once again i think we tend to be surprised uh, um i think that that the chatbot thing is a big surprise, and I think it's going to have impacts in society in ways we don't completely understand. Some of them may not be good. Did you ever see the movie Her? Um, no. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson. It's about a lonely programmer who falls in, in love with an intelligent um, uh, AI voice played by Scarlett Johansson. I think it's one of the best, um, most compelling science fiction movies I've ever seen. And it it describes um, an, a, a very lonely human being who's who who finds friendship with one of these um, one of these systems. Now it's real. I mean, just two days ago, um, a, a company by the name of Inflection AI uh, introduced an empathic uh, AI. It's a it's a conversational robot that's meant to have empathy. I played around with it for a while. It, it, I mean, first of all, it. It's kind of it kind of icky. It's all it's just so nice and happy face, and it it does you know it, it's kind of kind of irritating to talk to it because it's so upbeat and cheery, and you know you I, you don't always want that in the conversation. But um, you know, in twenty thirteen or fourteen, Microsoft did an experiment in China with a program called Zhao Ice, way before they had these kind of language skills, and they've found a population of millions of young Chinese who had intense, intimate, long conversations with these things. 25% of them said, I love you to it. Um, they called it toilet time because the kids would take their smartphones into the bathroom and have conversations with the machines. And where that disturbs me is that even though you're having this interaction with the machine, you're actually having less interaction with other human beings. You're becoming more isolated. Yeah, but isn't yeah. that the, what the market's doing in China, though? Or is it Japan that has the robots that are like girlfriends or something like that? They have that all over whole... the world, not just yeah. in China and Japan. But it started yeah. there. That was a big thing for them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, so um, that worries me. Um, you know, the degree to which we become more atomized and isolated. I mean, look at the I grew up in a generation that did not have dating apps. And I don't know a lot of millennials, but all the millennials I know, um, you know, almost all their social interaction happens through hookups um, with one application or another. That is the norm now, not the e exception. And, you know, they they find marriage partners or not, you know, they, they just continue to hook up. Um, yeah. That's a very different world than the world I, the, the world I lived in. Uh, and I it just happened.
it brings up more dangers and more concerns, but I think you also come across like a lot, it, it, it evolves. Like all these stuff starts coming into more corporatization, I would say. Like Tinder, for instance, I did an episode about this recently because I was interested. I, I downloaded the app on my phone to swipe an app, someone's attractive or not. I, I I never downloaded it in the beginning when there was a hype about it, but I'm on there and it's like, you do a couple swipes and they're like, you need to pay for more swipes. I'm like, how much is $24.99 a month? I'm like, excuse me, how much for what? And I'm looking at my... Was was this like supposed to be this expensive? Like, well, if you go Tinder Gold for a year, it's six ninety nine a month. I'm like, doesn't help. I don't want to spend that much thing. And it's like, if you miss, and there's so many psychological issues that go with it. But it's just the aspect of like, it's starting to be involved in things of now being the only form that people communicate with now, and they can advertise through it. They can do so much now, which I just don't consider that really communication. I consider even. I mean, this is still conversation. You still got to have the communication aspects to it. But there's not people going out there and doing things with other people anymore it's a thousand times easier to stay home and zoom has now became a household name yeah absolutely <laughs> and then zoom comment do you have zoom fatigue after a while yeah i'm burned out it's a hard <laughs> way to have, <laughs> to have it's a hard way to if you spend all day on zoom i, I they just update it way too many times you're like oh my god we just did one <laughs> yesterday <laughs> yeah no i i don't necessarily think that the the technology uh, will move in the correct direction on its own will. I mean, it's a question of human values and human design, and I worry about that because often human values are not the best values. <laughs> you know. Um. So I, yeah, I mean, I I appreciate the time you gave me, Mr. Markoff, to talk on the show. I know we kind of covered a wide range of subjects, but I, I got to ask. I mean, when it comes to all your research in the technology, is there any specific moments like? periods in your mind that stick out as this is a foundational moment where is it branch off i know we talked about some stuff earlier but i mean anything of recent times i would say some like 2000s well, up yeah don't say, so chat, me, don't say chat gpt we just talked about yeah that. i know i know um i won't say chat gpt although if i could i would um <laughs> there was a moment right at the very beginning uh let me go all the way back and then i'll try to answer your question about current stuff um my whole life was changed by seeing a, a, a research computer at Xerox Park called an Alto. I mean, I was a young, struggling journalist who worked on typewriters. And a friend of mine who'd gone to high school with me brought me into this computer lab and showed me this computer. And I saw my first text editor. I saw you know, text moving around on screens and being cut and pasted with mice. And I just... I, I mean, that was the most shocking thing I'd ever seen. If you imagine going from a typewriter to a modern text-based uh, editing system, that 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 had a huge impact on me. Um, I, that was exciting. So let me go, you know, in the last four or five years, I'm largely interested in things that are not about computers, um, other kinds of technologies. Um, there is, is a, a really neat... Uh, uh, optical technology called metamaterials. And they've been, there are rapid advances in that field that are going to change everything. Um, there's a company called MetaLens um, in, um, in Cambridge that is based on work that was done on a lab at Harvard that is beginning to replace uh, glass and plastic lenses with thin, transparent pieces of silicon. So in the future... Those on your iPhone, those big bulges for the lenses are going to go away and they'll be replaced by these very powerful, basically silicon chips that will do things that optical lenses did uh, in the past. And, you know, the the economics are, you know, when you have a half a billion cell phones, you can sell you can sell a lot of silicon. And that's happening right now. Um, you know how your iPhone um, has a structured light sensor where the password is your face. Yeah, face ID. Yeah, it's basically it's it's illuminating face ID is illuminating your face with a infrared light, and then getting back an image um, with a, a sensor, and that sensor will be replaced first. The, one of the first applications is a struck uh, a a metal lens piece of silicon will replace the lenses that are used in that system, uh, in the you know in one or two years, and they're starting to make them now. But then it'll it'll also allow these what are called computational lenses um, uh, that that are are silicon and not glass and that that fascinates me I I, I love the idea. Can they make a 
one that like a phone that you could actually take a picture of the moon because every time i do it i know how far technology has gone but they have oh, never you know gotten this, a good picture you you know that story it's a case of cheating um, so samson has a phone with a, a, a very powerful um camera in it um, in terms of magnification and they wrote code in there that when you point it at the moon it cheats and they have the picture, the high resolution picture already there. Um, and what? I, yeah, now this was this was in the news a couple of weeks ago. So you pointed it. It doesn't. It doesn't actually look. It grabs something out of its database and gives you something that looks like it should look, and it looks really good. And that to me is just outrageous. But they've done that <laughs> already. I, I looked at the camera on this thing is insane. We can like be able to like, I mean, there's a thing where like if you just put it on, like if you're going to point at your feet or something, you can zoom out from that. And it like goes like it's like a bird's eye kind of, you know, a bird's eye view, but it's really, really far back. And I'm like, how does it even do that? It makes everything look super long. Like you're going down a hallway or something like that. So it's amazing. But every time I take a picture of the moon or something like that, it does not come out right at all. It comes out blurry as all heck well there's a french uh, telescope company consumer uh, company called unistellar that makes these beautiful telescopes that add computing to the process of image take uh, image generation and you can use it in an urban area with lots of light and get remarkable pictures of deep sky objects and i just love that and they do this pro there's this there's this process called stacking where you take multiple images and then you put them on top of each other and and um, uh, align them precisely, and you get super resolution. Um, and it's it's a beautiful technology, and it you know it costs a couple thousand bucks, but it's a it's and you know it it has a database of fifty thousand objects or something, and you just give it instructions. Oh, it doesn't even have a lens. You see the results on your iPad instead of on by peering through an optical lens, which I think is neat too. Give it ten years, every phone will have that capability or whatever device we're using next. I can tell you. Yeah, that much. yeah. Oh, and I tell my friends I want this. They say, but look at they've got the the James Webb Telescope that takes the most beautiful pictures in the world or the Hubble. Why would you want to have your own amateur telescope? I'm still trying to figure that out. Huh. Well, Mr. Markoff, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show. Is there a place where people can find your links, any books, social media links, anything like that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think I'm johnmarkoff.com or at the New York Times. Um, and uh, I'm just Jay Markoff, Jay Markoff at Gmail if people want to reach me. And I'll make sure I link those in the description. I appreciate the time. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.